Hello and welcome to a webcast that I've been looking forward to make for a while now. Up until now, all of my webcasts have been purposely evergreen. I'm talking about sports betting theory and concepts that can help you as an aspiring sports better, no matter when you come about these videos. However, today I'm going to talk about a specific topic at a specific point in time. Today we're talking baseball, and specifically the 2020 Major League Baseball season. This is the first of the major sports to return, and as a result, there may be many of you who have only casually bet on baseball in the past, but with all of this pent-up demand, uh, the prospect of betting on a real major sport is something that intrigues you. And given that this season is more of a sprint than a marathon, uh, betting baseball in 2020 might be of interest, and I don't blame you. It's a fascinating time to get interested in some serious baseball betting. Uh, I think you'll like what I have to share today. First though, if you are new to this channel, my name is Jack, people call me Captain Jack, and I talk about topics related to sports betting education. My goal is to help other people better understand what they're up against when it comes to sports betting and how to make it more sustainable for both your bankroll as well as the industry in general. If you like this content, giving this video a thumbs up goes a long way to helping YouTube recognize that this is quality content that should be shared with other people. Furthermore, subscribing to my channel costs you nothing, but it goes a long way to letting me know that you appreciate this content and encourages me to produce more of it. Plus, if you subscribe, it's a good way to be notified of future content on this channel. Okay, so let's talk betting baseball in 2020. I first got involved in betting on baseball back around 2004. I was coming from the angle of having counted cards at blackjack, and baseball seemed like the ideal sport because, uh, like blackjack, baseball seemed finite. In other words, baseball isn't defined by a clock, and there are only so many different states of play. Uh, man on first with one out, man on second and third with two outs, uh, man on first and third with one out. The point is, there's only so many different ways that a baseball half inning can go. In fact, there's about 24 of those different ways. It seemed like baseball was perfect for someone like me who was comfortable with numbers and comfortable in uh, judging risk and reward. But of course, the downside is that baseball is far more complex than that because while it's true that every scenario in baseball has been played out hundreds or thousands of times before, they all have some unique twist which makes them unique and that needs to be factored in as well. That said, one of my earliest profitable sports betting angles was betting on the number of home runs in a game. I found an offshore shop that would only list that line at one and a half, two, or two and a half home runs per game, uh, no matter who was playing. Maybe they would adjust the juice a little bit on each side, but for the most part, it was just one and a half, two, or two and a half. Uh, they seemed impervious to weather conditions, wind conditions, lineups. Uh, they just based everything on the starting pitchers and the ballpark involved. Well, I crushed those props for the better part of two years, and after two years, uh, that book went under and stole most of my profits. But the point was, I recognized that all it takes is one angle. And if you're looking at metrics and statistics that aren't being factored in, and you're the one person that can identify that nugget of information, uh, it opens up a whole new world to you and you feel like you've uh, you know, discovered the golden goose, so to speak. So uh, that's what really got me involved in wanting to pursue betting on baseball specifically further. Now, around 2005, I bought this book, uh, Betting Baseball, Betting Baseball 2005, in fact. In fact, that's why I named this webcast today, Betting Baseball 2020. It's kind of a tribute to that. Uh, this book was clearly self-published. Uh, it had only single side of the pages had print. Uh, it looked like it was probably bound on a spiral bounder of some kind probably mailed directly from the author. The author was uh, Michael Murray, and he did a great job of exploring topics that weren't covered by mainstream media at the time. Things like the push percentage of totals, uh, measuring hitters with OPS instead of uh, batting average, uh, measuring pitchers with whip and their ground fly ratio as a truer sense how they're going to perform in certain ballparks. In fact, he actually gave a rundown of all of the ballparks in the league. He gave uh, pictures to show you which direction they orient themselves, uh, which conditions they're susceptible to wind. Um, he also gave 
a list of park factors for all the parks in baseball, and then he gave biographies as well as stats for every umpire in the game. Uh, that was information that you can find today, but it wasn't readily available back then, and it was sort of like a uh, goldmine for me of, of finding all these different angles that possibly aren't being factored into the game. In fact, when I was uh, working on this video, I, I found that he actually put out a updated copy, Betting Baseball 2019, last year. Uh, I ordered the book. Uh, it hasn't arrived yet, but I'm anxious to see uh, where he's come from Betting Baseball 2005 to Betting Baseball 2019. I'm sure there's something in there that I'm going to enjoy finding out. This webcast isn't about the past, though. This is about the current season that's about to get started. I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you know the basics of betting baseball. You know what a run line wager is. You know how sports books work. This webcast is going to be about this specific shortened season and how it's different from all the ones before. Uh, we're going to talk about what makes this season special and how we can kind of manipulate some of these special things this season to hopefully get an edge. Uh, we're going to talk about good bets versus bad bets and some shortened season strategies that we can uh, utilize to get the edge this year. And I'm going to go over some resources that perhaps you haven't thought of before, but it might help you take your game to the next level. Let's start with good bets versus bad bets. So for years, baseball has been the home of an ongoing low vig promotion that's one of the best in any sports book available. It's called the Dime Line. And it's been a tradition that if the money line on a baseball game is roughly between even money and uh, minus 160 or so, that the book will only employ a 10 cent straddle. In other words, uh, minus 120 on the favorite and plus 110 on the underdog, or minus 150 on the favorite, plus 140 on the underdog. And that reduces the theoretical house edge on the, uh, the wager to about one and a half to two percent. Uh, it's really one of the better bets out there if you're a recreational better that doesn't really have a really strong indication of which team is going to win, but you want to you want to bet on your team at the lowest possible house edge. Well, the dime line in baseball was always the perfect way to do that. Unfortunately, though, we are on the cusp of a lot of uncertainty in the world, and uh, that overflows into baseball, and I believe the dime line is probably going to become a victim of that. Uh, it's always been more of a Nevada gaming staple. However, now we're seeing uh, sports books with more of a European influence uh, across the country. And I think the dime line is greatly endangered at this point. So currently, uh, only William Hill, yeah, William Hill, is the only one that's dealing a dime line nationwide. And uh, meanwhile, out in Nevada, the South Point still deal deals a dime line. And Circa offers uh, a reduced VIG line, which basically carries a 2% theoretical hold all through their Major League Baseball money lines all the way up the scale. So while it may look a little slightly different than a true dime line, uh, the Circa pricing is actually pretty aggressive uh, all the way up, up the scale. Now, conversely, a bad bet to avoid would be one that has a higher theoretical hold, a larger straddle. Uh, there's really no excuse if, again, if two teams are evenly matched. Uh, there's no excuse for that to go at minus 115 on either side, uh, not in a major market like this. Um, but I think you're going to more see the minus 110, maybe a minus 112 at a lot of these places. Uh, and that's unfortunate because I think the dime line is a great promotional tool and uh, it's benefited both recreational and sharp bettors alike for, for years. I would like to see it continue. I just don't think it will. Now, another good bet to explore in baseball is your derivatives. So these days you can bet on not just the whole game and not just the first five innings, but also the first three innings, the first seven innings, uh, just the first inning, just the second inning. Uh, really, the game of baseball might just be the king of derivatives. However, with that, there are good derivatives and bad derivatives. So what my advice to you would be to look for two-way derivative markets and stay away from multi-way derivative markets. Uh, for instance, will there be a run in the first inning? Yes or no. That's a good derivative. Uh, how many runs will be scored in the first inning? Zero, one, two, three plus. That's an example of a bad derivative. Uh, look at this screen here. Uh, the two-way yes-no market has about a 4.2% theoretical hold, while the other one, the exact runs, the theoretical hold is 13.7%. And hopefully it goes without saying, although I'll say it anyway, you're never going to get the best of it when you're dealing with a one-way prop market. 
In other words, if there is a line where there are two possible outcomes and they're only offering you to bet on one of those two outcomes, uh, it's probably not going to be a good wager. Now, there are times when a odds boost is framed in that direction, uh, and they sometimes can even be not so good. But for the most part, if you're only offered the over in an over-under, uh, chances are that price they've put on the over is not a competitive price. So you can probably go ahead and ignore any one-way prop or derivative market that gets offered. Baseball is a sport where it's often wise to have a natural aversion to betting large favorites. Laying a lot of chalk in baseball is often unadvisable because the unpredictability of a baseball game combined with the relative scarcity of scoring, that makes any outcome a valid distribution. And that's even more so this season. I'd say any wager, especially a season-long wager, where you're laying a big price to win something is not a good wager to make this season. Because with the shortened season, there is more variance at play. This is a good season to be looking for outliers and not heavy probable results that require you laying a lot of money. Recently there was a debate over an ESPN article where someone had recommended uh, laying 16 to 1 minus 1600 on the LA Dodgers to make the playoffs. Now that debate was whether there is ever a time to lay minus 1600 correctly. Now of course there are times when it may be correct to lay 16 to 1. However, in a much shortened baseball season where the effect of a injury or of a virus or a, even of a slump is greatly magnified, it's probably not a good time to lay a heavy favorite. If anything, I'd be looking for the opposite. Teams like uh, the Marlins to emerge in the NL East uh, from that logjam of teams there. Uh, teams like the Reds to break past the Cardinals and Cubs for a change. Uh, you can get some pretty long odds that uh, for once are not tying up your money for a long period of time uh, in, the, in the form of future wagers. Now, normally I'm not a fan of futures wagers. Uh, I think that the, the house edge in futures bets is too high and tying up your money for a long period of time is too much uh, when you could be using it elsewhere. But in this scenario, with a shortened season and with some dutiful line shopping, uh, you should be able to lower that house edge uh, to a lower manageable synthetic house edge. And I think Major League Baseball in 2020 is the rare chance to embrace variance. And uh, we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Now, the last example of a good bet to make is player props. And those of you that come at sports betting from a DFS background, and you're only now sort of getting into the mix of regular sports betting, uh, you understand the factors that can be involved that can make a player go over or under his uh, projected average in a game performance. So player props are often a good bet for you to look into. Now, player props are always a little bit tricky because books grow tired of the action uh, if you're just giving them action on props. So it's a good idea to mix in regular bets as well. Uh, however, with the short lead time to the relaunch of the season, it may be easier to identify who is ready in terms of uh, player performance and who is not. So props may especially be worth your time to look into during the shortened season. Now, meanwhile, a wager that I just don't understand why people have such affinity for is the Grand Salami wager in Major League Baseball. This is a wager on the total number of runs scored in any given day. And what I don't understand here is that people wager into this. However, if just one game on the day slate does not go to completion, the entire wager is void. And this season we're going to have uh, a slate full of games every single day. There's a higher probability that there's going to be possibly a rain out or some other event that causes a game to be canceled or shortened. And this is frustrating because you may hit the over well before the uh, West Coast games even start, but because there was a rain out in Minnesota, uh, your entire action is void and basically you wasted your time in trying to beat that wager. So uh, I've never understood why people like to play the Grand Salami. I don't think it's a great wager to do and there's better uses of your time. Let's get into some of the rule changes that are going to happen in baseball, in Major League Baseball in 2020. I'm gonna go over the rule change and what the knee-jerk reaction is, and then we're gonna dig a little deeper and see what maybe the deeper effect might be. Uh, let's start with the DH rule in the National League. Hey, no more batting pitchers. 
uh, probably fewer premature exits due to needing a bat in the sixth inning. Um, the knee-jerk reaction is that this will increase scoring in National League games. However, the National League has played with the DH before. Uh, any game they've had in an AL stadium since 1997 has had a uh, designated hitter. So we do have a sample size here to work from. And in games where the National League has used a DH, the average runs per game for that National League team is uh, 0.13 runs higher per game. Uh, for the National League team. N and now that it'll be National League versus National League, uh, I think a fair estimate is the DH rule will add about 0.26 runs per game to a National League game. Now, this isn't insignificant by any stretch, but it's also not a monumental change to the game. Uh, I'm a bit of a baseball purist, and I don't mind seeing this change, though. Uh, I've seen too many good pitcher performances that have been negated because the pitcher comes up to bat in a losing a game one to nothing and uh, they have a runner in scoring position and they just can't afford to let the pitcher bat. So they yank him out of the game uh, and then, you know, everything falls to pot for that for that team. Uh, now, here's the thing, though. What will be the reaction of the market? Now, I suspect some books may overvalue the change in their pricing. Because remember, uh, you know, we're going to have pitchers that might be a little bit more confident in their game if they don't have to spend the time batting. And we're going to have pitchers that uh, don't get prematurely yanked out. So that 0.26 runs uh, could be a little bit artificially inflated. Now, I think there are books that will overreact. And when I say the books will overreact, really, it's the market that will overreact. But these books will play into that uh, and uh, overreact to market forces. Uh, the next rule is the three at-bat minimum. Uh, the relief pitcher must face a three batters in an inning uh, before he uh, can be pulled from that appearance. Uh, now, the knee-jerk reaction to this is that you won't see as many lefty-on-lefty -lefty specialists uh, being brought into the game. So this may benefit left-handed batters, uh, especially left-handed power hitters, who previously would get countered uh, late in games. Now, this would seemingly increase scoring, although it might be a tougher one to quantify. I'm going to go on record as saying uh, I don't think this rule change will have a much material effect on the game. And the reason being is the second part of that rule that people are sometimes ignoring is that it's a three batter minimum or the end of the inning. So you can still bring in a left-handed pitcher to face uh, potentially just one batter if there's already two outs in the inning. Um, even so, you could bring him in when there's just one out in the inning and potentially he's just facing two batters. Uh, the thing that happens here is if you were to map out how much of an advantage you get from the lefty-on-lefty -lefty matchup and then measure that against the how much advantage, disadvantage you are at the lefty-on-righty matchup, which might not be much of a disadvantage at all, I think you're going to find that it plays out that bringing in that lefty, even if three times out of ten he needs to face the next batter in the lineup after this, this left-handed batter, uh, is still a relatively good play. These Major League Baseball teams, they have plenty of data analysts. Uh, they've worked these numbers. They've run their Markov chains to figure out the exact pathway of where it benefits them and, and where it doesn't. So I suspect that we haven't seen the last of the lefty-on-lefty -lefty matchup. In fact, we probably, even though there is now a no-spitting rule, we haven't seen the last of the loogie in Major League Baseball. Um, that is the lefty one-out guy. And I think we're still going to see plenty of lefty one-out guys, loogies, uh, in, in play in 2020. Now, speaking of pitching specialists, uh, what is the benefit of the expanded roster this season? Uh, now, the original plan for 2020 before the pandemic was that the roster was going to be expanded from 25 players to 26 players, but there was going to be no September call-ups uh, with the expanded 40-man roster. Uh, and Major League Baseball, when they did this reboot of the season here, uh, they decided they'll start with a 30-man roster for the first two weeks of the season. Then that goes down to 28 men for these, the next two weeks. And then after the 28th day of the season, it goes down to 26-man roster. So it's expected that every team will probably opt to carry extra pitchers in those slots since pitchers are more valuable in terms of usage. Uh, there's also going to be a 30-man practice squad that stays separate from the Major League team 
And uh, from this squad, they can have their call-ups and they can also bring three of those people onto road trips as well. Really, that 30-man squad is kind of indifferent. There's really only a chance of maybe a half dozen of them ever get called up this season, this shortened season. But it's important because it also helps Major League Baseball teams keep their prospects that are a little further down in their farm system uh, developing over the course of this season uh, without minor league baseball to play. So does it have an impact on the game though? Well, the knee jerk reaction might be that we're gonna experience September type baseball early in the season with this expanded roster. However, on deeper inspection, most of these teams are opting to use the bullpen strength instead of expanding the batting lineup. I still think we're gonna see a lot of pitching changes early on in the season. Uh, as I pointed out in the three batter minimum rule, I think we're going to see a lot of pitching changes uh, for batter specific situations. And uh, I think teams are going to want to keep extra pitchers around just in case they have starters that aren't quite stretched out uh, in this shortened uh, summer camp schedule. And I don't think we're going to see this rule affecting hitting lineups all that much. Now, with reduced days off, workload management is still a major factor for a lot of these clubs, but I don't think the expanded rosters are gonna come into play when it comes to workload management. And then of course, by the 28th day of the year, of the season, we get down to the new normal, which is a 26 man roster. Now, here's the one that I'm most excited about, uh, the extra innings change. Uh, not that I'm excited in terms as a baseball purist, but I'm excited because this has a dynamic change on how the game will be played going forward. Now, each extra half inning starts with a runner on second base. And this takes the run expectancy for the half inning uh, up from the major league average, which used to be uh, 0.48 runs expected per half inning uh, with the bases clear to 1.1 runs expected with a man starting on second base uh, with no outs. That's huge. I mean, that is a dynamic change to how extra innings are going to look and how scoring is going to be distributed. Uh, if you're not familiar with run expectancy, you really should be. Basically, it's a, it's a table that says in any in this given situation, here is the probability that a run will be produced. Here is the expectancy of how many runs will be produced. Uh, it's something that I've kind of committed to memory over the years, and I often find as I'm watching a baseball game, I kind of think in terms of run expectancy. Uh, you know, if, if a runner gets to first base with no outs, well, I'm still about... Uh, you know, a half run expectancy in the inning, but if he gets to second base with no outs, I know I'm up to about a 1.1 run expectancy. But it's something you should be familiar with as a better looking into Major League Baseball. So in this case, that rule change changes the probability that a run will be scored in a half inning from about 27% to start to a whopping 61% per half inning. Uh, so the knee jerk reaction to that is that, oh, we're gonna have fewer games that go deep into extra innings. Um, but I think beyond that, we're gonna see multiple runs being scored when a game goes to extra innings. Now, currently about 8% of Major League Baseball games go to extra innings. And I think most avid bettors would recognize that uh, even numbered totals are more likely to skew over because they can't end in a tie. You know, if, if you have a game lined at eight or eight and a half, it can't end at four, four. And I think this rule change is going to add uh, about 0.2 runs on average per game across the board. And if you have a two evenly matched teams, uh, this change increases that effect even more. There's gonna be more runs being scored if, uh, if two teams are more likely to go to extra innings. Um, I think it also makes a change to in-game betting as well. Here's the thing about Major League Baseball in-game betting. It's the most solved sport for in-game betting line making of any of the four major US sports. And as a result, uh, the, the numbers haven't changed for a while. It's, it's pretty easy to compute what the projected uh, proper line is in any given situation in Major League Baseball. This changes things, especially late in game. This, this definitely throws a curveball into the mix. Uh, I'm interested to see how the sports adapt and if they recognize that. Um, and that's about all I wanna say about that at this time. Okay, so we've talked about the good bets versus bad bets. We've talked about the rule changes. Now let's talk about how to approach the betting strategy uh, for this sprint of a season. So the first strategy I'm looking to employ this season is to recognize that as sample size decreases, variance increases. Uh, every year, somebody hits a home run in the first two games of the season, and inevitably somebody says, well, they're on pace to hit 162 home runs this season. And of course, that's 
impossible to do. Um, and this year, that's not going to be different. We're going to hear, uh, if somebody hits a home run in the first two games, we're going to hear somebody say, well, they're on pace to hit 60 home runs this season. Uh, and honestly, it's more of a valid conversation this year, maybe not for 60, but we could see some statistical outliers this year. Um, and an outlier is kind of the perfect description of 2020, right? Uh, so why wouldn't Major League Baseball follow suit? Uh, there's been a few blogs that have popped up recently actually talking about this very thing. And uh, I actually bet some season-long props based on the epistemic uncertainty. That's one of my new favorite phrases, epistemic uncertainty. And what that essentially means is that when you have models that are limited in what they can know, uh, there is a certain amount of uncertainty in the results that you can't possibly model. And it's a great counterpoint to everyone who thinks that sports betting is all about data models and only data models. Well, yeah, but there's epistemic uncertainty and it needs to be factored in. So in this case, uh, I think you simply can't divide this season and the projections by 2.7. That's the number you get when you divide 162 by 60, 2.7. Uh, you can't do that and expect to get accurate projections. You have to allow for other outliers that will exist given your smaller sample sizes. Uh, back when I played blackjack, there was a phrase I was fond of, and it was, when n equals 1, anything can happen. That means the results of one game, one result, one hand of blackjack, uh, are not indicative of what's going to happen in your lifetime of blackjack, and you can't read too much into one thing. Well. Similarly, as n is smaller this year, as the number of samples in our sample size is smaller this year, we're going to see some outliers, and we can't really read into it, but it's sometimes nice to embrace that variance that's going to happen in the course of this season. Now, if you want to learn more about this concept and maybe think of how to apply it to your betting, uh, Fangraphs recently had a great article about it. Uh, they answered the question of, will we see a 400 hitter this year? Uh, but moreover, a guy by the name of Plus EV Analytics uh, on Twitter, he posted a absolute killer blog about it. He created a distribution model, and then he analyzed certain bets that were available to many people, both in legal and offshore jurisdictions, and uh, told you which way to go with it. And his his analysis was pretty spot on. Articles like that are almost kind of dangerous because they not only give you the picks, which everyone tends to want, but they also give you the process so you can learn a lot from them in the future. Uh, I'm going to link both of those articles in the notes underneath this video, uh, but don't go check them out right now. Uh, by the time this video drops, uh, those markets will have closed, unfortunately. Uh, so sorry, you're, you're stuck watching me for a little bit longer, hopefully. And by the way, now is probably a good time to announce that uh, Plus EV Analytics, as well as Andrew Mack, uh, aka the guy that wrote the Statistical Sports Models in Excel series of books that came out in the last year, uh, they're going to be my guests on Wednesday, July 29th, in a live happy hour event. They're both brilliant quantitative sports analysts, and they both have done a great job of kind of opening up their knowledge to the world and uh, allowing you to learn from their processes. Um, it's gonna be a great time of Q&A and discussion on a lot of things regarding uh, sports analysis and model building and uh, taking a quantitative approach. Um, I'll be having more to say about that coming up on Twitter, but the date is uh, July 29th. The NBA season is going to be in on July 30th, so this is a good time. Get a little bit more uh, preparedness in and uh, it'll be a live happy hour at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And, uh, but the exclusive announcement is here uh, during this video and look for more information on Twitter in the coming days. So the next strategy for a shortened season is to be aware of sudden and unexpected lineup changes. Uh, teams are gonna be very sensitive to anyone who's not feeling 100%, and I suspect we may have uh, more late changes in lineups than we normally see. Sportsbooks are already preparing for this. Uh, they've dropped the concept. Many of them have dropped the concept of listed pitchers. Uh, when you make a bet, that's the line you get no matter who throws the first pitch of the game. If you're a better that works on identifying lineup changes and how they affect the game, and hey, that's not a bad angle whatsoever, uh, you need to be on your toes this year. Major League Baseball is trying to control the flow of information. Uh, they want to use uh, their partner in Sport Radar to, to disseminate the lineup information as evenly as possible. And they require that the managers submit their lineups and any changes 
to Major League Baseball at least 15 minutes before they tell anyone else. Now, a good thing to keep in mind is if you're getting beat up this year uh, and you can identify that you're getting beat up because of lineup changes kind of going the wrong way, you're on the wrong side, you think a player is going to play and he doesn't play, uh, you may want to focus on more anti-fragile derivative bets or maybe in-game bets rather than focusing on uh, a pre-game bet where you're susceptible to lineup changes. Um, the sports books have a built-in edge here. They can get the information or they know the the bettors that know this information that beat them and they can adjust when they see their lines, when their wagers coming in. Uh, so you may be outmatched when it comes to the information war that's going to happen with Major League Baseball this year. So there's no shame in just focusing on a derivative or in-game. Um, there's going to be situations daily where a star player all of a sudden is scratched at the last minute. And you need to understand that that's part of Major League Baseball, betting baseball in 2020. Now, the last strategy that I want to go over involves the trade deadline. And the trade deadline this year is going to be August 31st. That's roughly about 60% of the way through this shortened season. Uh, there's a good chance that the playoff races are going to be hotly contested this year. Uh, there's just not enough games out there to kind of gain the spacing that we normally see in the Major League Baseball season. So that doesn't mean that we won't see moves, though, at the end of the August uh, trade deadline. What we're going to have in Major League Baseball is a lot of owners that are feeling a cash crunch. They didn't make money this year, uh, and they're going to need to find a way to accommodate uh, their team's payroll in coming years because of that. So there's a lot of situations where there might be a good player that's on the market or there might be a surprise move uh, to kind of dump some salary or to get rid of some toxic assets when it comes to their payroll. Uh, and there may be other managers, other, other uh, ownership groups that are deciding, you know what, the best way to make money in the long run is to win a championship in the short run. And they may be willing to overpay and overspend so that they can uh, win that championship now. So there's definitely going to be reasons to keep an eye on futures markets. Again, I'm advising futures markets like I never have before because these changes that happen could have bombastic effects on the futures market as it happens towards the trade deadline. So you need to be prepared to maybe be able to jump on something where the price is gonna dr drastically change as soon as the, the move is announced or, or filters down to the sports book. So uh, be prepared to stay on top of that. I think it's gonna be an exciting race this year. I think we're gonna have a lot of divisions where there's a log jam of teams between 31 and 35 wins. Uh, we might have some crazy tiebreaker situations, three-way tiebreakers, where there's multiple playoff games that have to be played in order to figure out who's going to the playoffs. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Major League Baseball is at the last minute scrambling to see if possibly they can expand the playoff picture this year, because I think they realize that uh, they're going to have a lot of crazy log jams right at the end of the season. If I have piqued your interest over the course of the past few minutes and you're more interested in betting baseball in 2020 than you had been when you started this video, well then good, or I'm sorry, I'm not sure which it is. Uh, personally, I had decided I was not going to bet baseball in 2020 and then I sat on my hands for five months over the course of the pandemic and now I can't think of anything I'd rather do than bet baseball in 2020. So I do have some resources for you. I do have some books and, and websites and people to pay attention to that I think will help further your journey along when it comes to being a sharper uh, baseball better. So here's a list of books and uh, I'm going to start with a book that is, a, is about 30 years old now. It's called The Physics of Baseball. Uh, it's written by a professor, a doctor professor at Yale, who was commissioned by Bart Giamatti back when he was the baseball commissioner. And uh, what Giamatti wanted was a study of the physics of baseball. And so uh, this has basically uh, the statistics and study of every effect on baseball, whether it be the weather, whether it be wind, uh, humidity, barometric pressure, um, uh, altitude, uh, launch angle. Uh, this was before StatCast, so basically um, there wasn't really a better way to measure launch angle, but this book talked about uh, 27 degrees being the proper launch angle, and years later, StatCast information bared that out. So that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. So uh, like I said, this book's about 30 years old. It's still a great read. It's a quick read. If you're somebody who's just interested in kind of learning how this all should tie together, this is a great place to start, The Physics of Baseball. 
Uh, second book here on the list is Joe Pita's book, which is another one that's a few years old now, Trading Bases. Um, this is one of those landmark sports betting books I think everyone should read. Joe talks about his process and his path as he tried to become a professional sports better in Las Vegas, recuperating from a debilitating injury and how he approached betting on baseball. It was a unique approach back then. I think it still has uh, valid legs when it comes to how you approach baseball to do it in the way that Joe did it, uh, kind of valuing each player in the lineup and what effect they have. Um, but uh, Joe's book is great. If you haven't read it before, it's, it's a quick, easy, great read uh, for anyone interested in sports betting. Uh, the next book here is simply titled The Book. It talks about how to play by the book, um, what the book says about every situation in baseball. Uh, it's a fascinating book um, about percentages and probability when it comes to baseball. Uh, it's a good way to kind of get involved with the sabermetric revolution, but at the same time kind of keeping a level head about it. Um, the authors are some of the the three top minds when it comes to betting on baseball that have ever existed. So uh, I'd highly recommend uh, anyone who is interested in betting baseball, you definitely need to read the book at some point. Uh, but then let's go a little deeper in here. Let's go to a book uh, called The Introduction to Empirical Bayes. Uh, and this is basically about uh, Bayesian analysis of statistics and probability. Um, you know, I've said before that, you know, we talk a lot a bit about um, how we approach statistics and probability, but we're rarely talking Bayesian. And this is a book that, that does that and does it based on baseball. So it actually applies very well. So this book is not written for a baseball better, but it is actually uh, very applicable for a baseball better. And I think you're going to get a lot out of it as you, if you read it uh, from the viewpoint of a baseball better. So um, it, that's a hidden gem right there. I've never shared that one before, but it's, it's a good read. Uh, it helps you kind of think a little bit more outside the box when it comes to probability and statistics in baseball. Uh, and then there's a book here, uh, Fan's Guide to Baseball Analytics. Uh, if you're one of these people that you hear all these these terms, uh, war and, um, you know, WOBA and uh, FIPS and Sierra, and you're kind of like, what does that all mean? Well, this is a good book and kind of going through all those terms, you know, a good handy reference guide as to uh, how to calculate them and how they all add up and, and what they really mean in terms of uh, betting baseball. And then finally, I have a book here. If you take that extra step further and you go on to uh, being someone who wants to build your own models, um, R is a good language for that. And there is a very strong book here called Analyzing Baseball with R. Uh, this is the second edition. Uh, I haven't read the second edition, but I did read the first edition. Um, it's not a cheap book. It's going to run you over $50. It's worth it. It is worth the price. Um, there's a lot of information here on using StatCast information, gathering data, um, scraping data with R, uh, analyzing data, uh, you know, using R in many different ways. It's actually a great book for learning R too, because it, it comes at it from the uh, sports betting angle, which is what a lot of people are using R for. So this is another good book that not a lot of people have picked up, but is, is very strong. Um, it, you know, it's a little price prohibitive for a lot of people, but it's definitely worth the $50, $60, whatever it costs to, uh, to get the book. So now let's talk about some websites. Okay. We talked about some books, but honestly, websites are often more, uh, easier to deal with because, uh, it's more instant. Uh, so I have a few here that we're going to lead off with the, uh, prohibitive favorite in the group. And that is fan graphs. Uh, if you're not reading fan graphs, you're missing out. Uh, there's always some interesting articles. It has to do a lot with the sabermetric revolution of baseball, but at the same time, it has a lot to do with the analytical approach to baseball, not just the sabermetrics. Um, sometimes the, the detail of the analysis gets lost in the math of the um, quantitative buildup of, of sabermetrics. So uh, fan graphs is definitely something you want to use. Uh, they have a ton of information on there that's usually not available anywhere else. And I know uh, you're going to probably want to scrape it, those of you who are big time data scrapers. I will say that they are not entirely tolerant of data scrapers. So you need to be careful. You need to tread lightly when you deal with fan graphs. You don't want to find your IP address being uh, blocked or limited. Um, and it does happen. Um, it happened to me. I was using a cloud-based uh, system for my data scraping. And uh, that unfortunately that IP range got blocked off because I guess somebody was being a little too aggressive with how they were scraping fan data. So um, 
that's just a word for you guys that are going to go into uh, data scraping off of fan graphs. Uh, the next one is a site that is very scrapable friendly, and that's Baseball Reference. So Baseball Reference, I've talked about uh, the, the sports reference series of websites in my Making a Modeler series. Uh, Baseball Reference is the, kind of their flagship um, product that started it all. Um, it's a great place. They have tons of information, tons and tons of information there on just about every game that's ever been played in baseball history. Um, so it's a, it's a great reference point for pulling up historical data sets and uh, scraping some past results and scenarios in baseball. So definitely look into Baseball Reference. Another good site is Baseball Prospectus. Now, Baseball Prospectus, has it's a little bit more behind a paywall. It's not an expensive paywall whatsoever, but uh, it's a decent website. Their Pocota um, projections were used to be kind of the gold standard if you wanted to kind of figure out how a player was going to perform this year before the season started. Um, and they were usually pretty spot on. They would take into effect the age of players um, and they would compare them against other trajectories of other players over time. Nate Silver used to be a major writer at Baseball Prospect Prospectus. And uh, they've, they've annually published a big book uh, that I used to get every year. And basically it was kind of all the stats of all the players. Um, and I would sometimes have to manually enter some of the information from that, but it was useful to do so. So Baseball Prospectus is a great book to, or a great website to check out. The book's still not bad, but all the information can be had on the website. And uh, if you pay their subscription fee, you can download uh, basically a data sheet of um, every player in the league, their Pocota projections and stat projections, and kind of use that basing going forward as uh, your baseline for analyzing players. And the last website I'll mention is Baseball Savant. So Baseball Savant used to be, I guess, what you could call is a passion project of uh, Darren uh, Willman. And Darren created uh, this website that had to do a lot with scraping a lot of Major League Baseball stats from Major League Baseball Advanced Media. And uh, he did such a great job that Major League Baseball basically acquired his site and acquired his services. And so now Baseball Savant is part of the MLB.com package of websites. And it's fascinating. Basically, it is your best deep dive into all kinds of stat cast data, pitch effects data. The good thing about Major League Baseball is they've, they've made all of that data free and available over the years via XML scrapers and uh, via JSON scrapers. And it's all right there for you. StatCast, uh, or sorry, with uh, Baseball Savant allows you to kind of have a better user interface to a lot of that data. And you can pull up the data, you can export the data. Uh, it's a very vast uh, and comprehensive website. They have some tutorial videos. Um, and, you know, as someone who's now kind of familiar with YouTube, I can tell by the, the uh, metrics of those YouTube videos, they're not being seen by a lot of people. So if you want to get the leg up on a lot of other sports bettors, uh, check out their tutorials on YouTube uh, that are accessible through the Baseball Savant website. And then you can kind of learn to use their site a little bit better than maybe some of the other sports bettors out there and see if you can uh, get a leg up. Now, the final resource website that I have is not so much a website. It's actually someone to uh, listen to. And uh, I'm listing here uh, vSyn, uh, specifically Gil Alexander. Gil Alexander runs the A Numbers Game uh, show, which is broadcast 10 to 12 Eastern, uh, 7 to 9 Pacific time uh, each weekday. And what Gil is good for, though, is Gil will talk baseball with anyone. And Gil talks a lot of advanced metrics. Uh, he'll tell you what FIP and Sierra mean. He'll tell you what, uh, you know, WOBA, what, what's the difference between WOBA and WRC and WRC+. Plus. Gil's very good at kind of breaking down the uh, analysis of baseball and kind of talking about it from a sports better's perspective. And also Gil has a lot of guests on. He'll have on Paul Sporer from Fangraphs. Uh, he'll have on uh, Jason Weingarten, who's a very good uh, baseball better. Uh, so he, he definitely knows how to pick and choose the people that'll know how to talk about baseball betting best. And uh, so sometimes uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, maybe not so much this year, but in most years, uh, Gil is a great listen when it comes to uh, finding out more about baseball. Okay, so that's about going to do it for this webcast. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I really looked forward to producing some content about something that was relevant just to today and uh, kind of get my juices flowing for betting baseball in 2020. Um, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and use the comment section down below. 
as with my other videos, uh, I'm willing to discuss this for weeks on end uh, as questions roll in as people watch this video. So go ahead and leave a comment down below. Maybe we can get some discussion going on the different uh, ways that baseball is different in 2020 and maybe some angles that I didn't think of to put into this video. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up down below as well as uh, subscribing. That goes a long way to making me know that people are enjoying this content. Now, I would have loved to end this episode with the closing theme to This Week in Baseball. Uh, it was kind of epic when I was growing up, uh, that, that closing theme. I searched and tried to find how I could obtain the rights to the song. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to come up with finding out how to get the rights, and I don't want to run into copyright issues with YouTube. So in your mind, imagine that we close this out with that stirring This Week in Baseball closing theme. And uh, But otherwise, I will see you here next time. Thank you.